Hey everybody, welcome back to the ECG channel. My name is Reed. Don't forget before we get started to go ahead and download the week's or today's PDF uh, for this ECG so that you can follow along, make notes, save it for later, whatever you want to do. Um, if you're there and you like the videos, go ahead and like and subscribe and help support the channel. And uh, so let's jump into it. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the forest here and the trees of the forest are our QRS. And so I like to just look at a rhythm strip and get an idea of what's going on. I see narrow QRSs. It seems to be pretty narrow, marching down, very regular in their rate. Let's take a look and calculate the rate. We've got a QRS that lands on a solid line here. So 300, 150, 175, 60, maybe 65 beats per minute so it's a normal rate uh, let's see we've got some p waves it appears and so let's evaluate this ecg a little bit more um, the first thing i like to do now that i've kind of got an idea of what's going on is evaluate my atrial activity and my p wave morphology we said we do see p waves and those p waves if i look are upright in lead one and they're upright in avf and so that is a sinus P wave because the sinus node is in the top right and it's going to depolarize down to the left. So we'll see positive forces in those leads. Next thing I like to do is I like to measure my intervals. I really like to start with the PR interval because that measures my AV node, which is the next piece of the pie in our conduction system. And so my AV node is represented by my PR interval. And so I like to find P waves that are sharp. These, sharp, these P waves here in this ECG aren't too terribly sharp. Usually I can find a good one in V1, but we'll settle for this one in here at V2. Um, so I found my QRS here, and I find the beginning of my P wave, which seems to be right about there. And I notice my PR interval is a little bit over 200 milliseconds. I'd say maybe this is 240 milliseconds, and so that is too long. So we've got some type of AV block. We need to figure out what kind it is. Is this a first degree, a second degree? What I want to look for is just make sure that my P waves, there's one P wave conducting to every QRS, and so that's what I see. I see a lot of P waves. I don't see any extra P waves in the middle. And so this every P wave is conducting to a QRS. It's just a little bit long. So this is a first degree AV block. Next thing I'm going to do is evaluate a little bit about my QRS. And so I'm going to look at my QRS axis. My QRS axis is upright in lead one. It's isoelectric in lead AVF. I'd say a little bit upright, but upright in AVL. So it could be somewhere, if I looked over here, my, my QRS may be kind of right along this way. So that's normal axis to a degree. I would say normal QRS axis here. Almost um, maybe leftward, you could say. Um, what I like to do uh, after that is just make sure that I've got a good R wave transition. I've got little R waves here in V1 and they get larger as we go towards V6. Maybe some early transition here, kind of V2, V3 early R wave transition. That's okay. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at our QT interval. And my QT interval, if you can tell, I like to go kind of in between two R waves here. My, my QT interval should terminate, my TO should be terminated by there, and so I'd say my QT is good in this setting. Last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look for pathological Q waves and ST and T wave segments. I don't see any pathological Q waves outside of this one in lead three, so it's really hard to say exactly if that is because of an old inferior infarct. I would expect to see maybe more changes in my other inferior leads, which are lead two and AVF, so I'm not gonna call that. But what I do see whenever I evaluate my ST segments is I've got this ST elevation here in V2. If you look here, a little bit of ST elevation in, in V2. And when I look and evaluate that QRS morphology a little closely after looking at my STs, I see that I've got kind of this, you'll know this to be something scary. And this is a little bit of a RS kind of R prime in V1 and an RS R prime in V2. But what happens is usually that R prime should be very sharp in a right bundle branch block. And these R primes are very slurry and they're creating ST elevation. And so when you see the R prime cause ST elevation, that should make you think, is this Brugada? And Brugada is a, um, we'll write it down, Brugada. 
Bravada syndrome is a sodium channelopathy. It's, it's typically genetic, and it causes, um, you know, when you have a defect with a sodium channel, you have some defects in your ventricular depolarization, and so you might see some abnormalities, and sometimes it affects people in their right ventricles more, which is why we get changes in these V1, V2 leads, which really capture right ventricular depolarization. And so when you look for Brugada, usually in an, in an RSR prime for right bundle branch block, that RS and that R prime is very sharp. And then it returns to baseline, and then you get your T wave. But in this case, we've got a slurry R prime. And so the way I like and I don't see any baseline. And something that Brugada, so Brugada syndrome, what you'll see is you're going to have ST elevation, in V1 and V2, you're going to see no return to baseline. So what does that mean? That means that notice that this kind of concavity of the ST segment is never flat. It's not flat. So the last thing we can do is we can measure angles. And so we can kind of make a triangle out of this. And so what I like to do is you measure from the, the tip of that R prime, and you measure a straight line down the angle. And what I'll do to make this a little bit easier is I'll make my pin a little bit thinner. And so you go from the tip and you measure a straight line down that angle, okay? And then you measure five millimeters inferiorly. So one, two, three, four, Five. You draw that line through, marking at five. And then what you do is you measure the distance here. And if that distance is somewhere above three and a half and four millimeters, then that can help you diagnose Brugada. So in this case, I would say that's about four millimeters, that distance. And that is too long. So we could say this person has a Brugada syndrome. And it's a sodium channelopathy. They have a high risk for sudden cardiac death and lethal arrhythmias. And so recognizing Brugada is incredibly important, especially in a young asymptomatic person that maybe has these episodes of fainting or a family history of, of sudden cardiac death if you're primary care. And so when you screen these folks and you see this on the ECG, you need to be cautious not to say that they have maybe an incomplete right bundle branch block, which other people can say. So Brugada can really mimic an incomplete right bundle branch block. Alrighty, so we said this is Brugada. Let's go ahead and kind of put this all together. We've got a sinus rhythm, normal sinus rhythm at a rate of 65 beats per minute. We've got this first degree AV block, and we've got a Brugada syndrome. This person probably is gonna need to have a pacemaker implanted uh, so that if they do go into a lethal arrhythmia, they're protected. So hope this video helps. Um, I don't have any lectures on Brugada, but I hope to in the future and uh, get you guys some good instruction. So don't forget to subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you tomorrow. Have a great day.